We wanted to see what would happen if we took Professor Peterson to a place which is associated with masculinity, associated with tough lives, but with discipline and with order. So we took him to Moss Side Fire Station Boxing Club in Manchester. And you know, Moss Side has a notorious aura around it. We started off by playing that clip that you've just heard of Professor Peterson getting very, very upset when talking about the plight of young men. And I started off by asking him if he felt much had changed since we last spoke. On a, on a very regular basis, daily basis, wherever I am now, um, people come up to me, and it's often men, and tell me the same sort of stories that I laid out in that clip, you know, that they've decided to develop something approximating a vision for their life and to adopt more responsibility and to straighten themselves out and that and that they can see why that's necessary because you all, you, you 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 can't just do it you also have to see why it's necessary because it takes effort to forego immediate gratification and resentment and aggression and 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 short-term status seeking let's say to put something away for the future you have to understand that you have a moral obligation to do that that's paramount and and partly what i'm trying to do is to provide people with an explanation that 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 carries them through the difficulties because i do believe that every person who doesn't bring forth their potential into the world leaves a gap that's filled by something that's not good and not good for anyone, not good for them, not good for their families, not good for the culture, and it's a real problem. And I believe that is the case for every single person. And so, have you become more emotionally robust towards the plight of young men, or does it upset you as deeply now as it did then? Do you need to be more emotionally robust towards it? No, I don't think I need to be. I, I think that it's, I don't, th I don't think there's anything good about it. I, I can't tell you how deeply I detest the idea that a series of ideas, you know, that our culture is a oppressive patriarchy. That's the best way to conceptualize it. And that the appropriate way to view history is the domination, the endless domination of women by men over the course of the last several thousands of years. And that any attempt by young men to manifest any ambition or competence is equivalent to power and all they're doing is taking their place in the pathological culture. All of that to me is, it's, it's, it's one-sided to start with, but I think it's appalling beyond description. And so, no, I certainly haven't become any less, um, what, repelled by that. And the fact that, I, and I also know more clearly than I did when we talked, to what degree that's a minority view. I mean, there was a good political science study published a week and a half ago or so that the Atlantic Monthly commented on showing that only 8% of Americans hold the ideological position that would push that view forward. And even 30% of them think that it's gone too far. And so not only do we have this insane narrative that's driven by, by ignorance and resentment, but it's, it's generated by a tiny minority of people um, most many of whom themselves even believe that it's gone too far. Going back to the clip that we played of you, um, and when I heard that, it resonated with me for some time. And then I came to this place. Mm -hmm. I visited it because Nigel Travis, who's sitting there, who runs uh, Moss Side Fire Station Boxing Gym, he came on my show and then he said, come down here. And it took me about a year to come down here. Sorry, Nigel, it did take a while. And then I came here. And then I thought, what he is doing is not dissimilar to what you're saying. Mm. In fact, it's quite close to what you're saying. Responsibility and meaning. That's what we need. Not just men, not just young men. We all need that in oh our yes. lives. But Nigel saves young men. There's two of them here, Connor and Hamden here. And he came in and I saw what he was saying to them and how he spoke to them to bring them order, a sense outside of the chaos, that when you come in here, the very strict set of rules, maybe more than 12. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it would be brilliant to bring a selection of 
men from different backgrounds for you to have a conversation mm. with them. Nigel, I'd, I'd love to, for you and Professor Peterson or Jordan uh, to, to have a conversation simply because there are things that you share. T tell me about what is your philosophy that you bring here? Our gym is, is built on respect. The whole ethos of our gym is, is respect. And as you walk in our gym, there's a, there are five standards that you need to adhere to. And, that's, and they are built around respect, respecting each other, respecting yourself, respecting the community, respecting the gym, and more importantly, the coaches, mm -hmm. of which I am one. <laughs> that's just people, the respect that they give to each other builds, builds bridges between communities, gives gives um, credence to, to relationships that uh, maybe they, they've never had and they've never been taught previously. So... Well, I really like the idea that you've combined boxing with that, that ethos, you know, because one of the things that is typically and thoughtlessly put forward is the idea that male aggression, let's say, is something that should be inhibited or suppressed or that perhaps boys should be socialized like girls, which I think is a dreadful idea. Um, and w in a boxing uh, establishment, obviously, the capacity for aggression is something that's not only allowed but developed, but it's brought under control. You know, and I think that sophisticated psychologists understand and sophisticated people understand that you don't make men harmless by making them weak. You make them useful and responsible by helping them bring their capacity for mayhem and aggression under long-term, conscious, careful control. And that's part of the respect. You know, I mean, one of the things about boxing, and this is true of any sport, I would say, is that you have to learn to take a blow and you have to learn to control your temper. And so, and that's a big deal because a lot of aggression, violent aggression, aggression goes astray when it's impulsive. And all the men that I've met who were, who, who were worthy people had a tremendous capacity for aggression, but it was contained and controlled. And so then they could use it carefully and voluntarily when it needed to be used. And it gave them a certain amount of, I would say, dignity, but it also was part of what made other people around them respect them very, very rapidly. You know, and I've seen this at every level of the hierarchy of, 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 of different occupations, even very sophisticated occupations. And so to, to integrate that aggression is much, much, much better strategy than to try to re op repress it out of existence. Well, it's, it's worth at this point, Professor Peterson, actually speaking to two of the boxers that we yeah. have here, Connor and Hamden. Um, what do you think, um, Connor, that uh, boxing has given you? Actually, give us a sense of your background, if you don't mind, your, your uh, family yeah, background sure. and, and kind of where you're um, So, I was, uh, well, I got into boxing when I was eight years old. Um, I was struggling at school. I was physically good at stuff, but I couldn't pr um, mentally do it. And um, so my mum just thought she'd bring me down to the gym and it gave me like, from f walking in the gym, the community, like everyone in the gym, it gave me like confidence. I was there a father um, there when you were growing no, up? No, it wasn't really, um, it wasn't that much around. Well, it was there, but it wasn't helping or doing nothing really. Um, but where was your model of, where's a male role model then for you? Um, was there one until you walked into here? Well, when I joined the gym, it was like nah, my coaches were like father figures to me. Mm. I had some someone to look up to. I said, "Oh, firefighters, sort of really good role models," and yeah. So, so why was it useful to you? Like when you came into the gym, what changed for you? You said it gave you confidence. It, um, well, they worked with me, so like I was good at. I was finally good at something. I right. found something I was good at. So I wasn't good at writing and reading and all that. So in school, I struggled. I used to punch the walls and right. stuff. So you found something you were good at and you had people paying attention to you yeah. for it and helping you develop that. Yeah. So that was a pathway forward for you that was positive. Uh, yeah, it was. I right. Was, yeah. Right. Well, it's unbelievably important for young people, well, for everyone, to find someone to pay attention to them. 
And, you know, attention is a funny thing because if you really pay attention to someone, it's not like you're just being nice to them. That's foolish. What you want to do when you're paying attention to someone is help them separate the wheat from the chaff. You say, look, you know, when you did this, you didn't do it right. And here's why you didn't do it right. And here's what you could have done differently. And so it's better for you if you fix that. And then here's a bunch of things that you did that were really good. Yeah. And you should do a bunch more of them. And, you know, then you know, when that happens to you, know that what you've done is, eno is important enough, your actions are important enough, so that at least someone else attended to them. And that can give you confidence that what you're doing is worthwhile, as well as helping you, you know, hone your abilities and your skills. Definitely. And so, and so how did that spill out into the rest of your life? So, um... It helped me like, so my family, uh, like it helped me with other things as well. So not just the confidence and stuff. So um, in high school, I was struggling with my GCSEs and I wanted to go to a boxing college. There's only like five around the country and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And you needed a, a certain grade in English and maths. So I had to really work hard in those if I wanted to continue in success in boxing, as doing boxing, and I wanted to go to this place, is I had to um, really right. So, so work that's hard a really good point too, because then, I mean, it's it's very unlikely that people will do difficult and disciplined things unless they have a goal. Yeah. Right, because difficult and disciplined things are hard, whereas useless and like impulsively pleasurable things are easy, and so. You need to have a goal, and so you, your story is, you know, people found, and you as well, found some things that you were good at. You had the opportunity to develop that. You could see that as a future that you actually wanted yeah. to attain, and that gave you the, the, the reason to discipline yourself. So how did that work out? So um, it works. Uh, I did really well in my GCSEs. I, um, like, I passed where I thought I would have got, and... How come? What did because you do differently? I, I'd like, I just got my head down because I really, I like, I had a goal and I had it set and I really wanted to get it done. So, and I don't, it just, right. yeah. Yeah, well you need a goal, man. Yeah. You need a goal. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and um, he's a national youth champion at boxing. Uh huh. So <laughs> he's a serious guy. Right. In the, in the boxing field. I mean, it's it's amazing. Hamden, what about your story then? Um, I'm from the manor, so around the corner from here. Um, I only got into boxing, I'd say, five years ago properly. Um, where I'm from, is a, is a, there's a massive football base, people. So I didn't really know of the gym very much. So every day I used to play football every single day and I thought, I can't really go far with this because I wouldn't get the support from my parents, even though my both parents were there. They wouldn't like, let me, I'd say, take a risk, if you know what I mean. If I wanted to do football, and, they wouldn't be like, right, we'll let you do football, everything, put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. they, they were down the more traditional route, go to university, study education, become a doctor, become an engineer. But um, Not a bad aspiration, yeah, which, which, to be fair. Yeah, which yeah. is good, yeah, to be fair, which is good. But um, I feel like with me, I was a, I liked sport as well a lot. So once I started, when I was in high school, I met Connor. We were in the same high school, so we've been friends a long, long time. Um, and then I used to see him traveling the world, going to New York, and I was like, I'm from the man. I won't be able to get to places like that. Let me walk down to the gym. So I got down to the gym, and it was like, it was, it was an atmosphere. It was everyone just working down, head, heads down. Everyone was grafting, working hard. And they were rewarded for it. If you put the effort in, you'd get rewarded. It? And with me personally, I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a bad kid who was struggling. I was, a, I, was, I was an ideal student, but um, when, once I got angry, when something like kicked off, I'd, I'd really get angry. But with me for boxing, it was, if someone's allowed to punch in, when you're in the ring, someone's smacking your head and punching your face in, and they're allowed to do that. But, and if you can control your anger then, mm -hmm. then you can do it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it was. So you couldn't control your anger outside. Yeah, it? once I, once it went off, right. I was, I just went off. But um, yeah, and coming in was like having people invest time and effort into me, and it made me feel like I've got to do that as well. So, right, right. I'm a volunteer of the year. Like I won this year. Congratulations. So, cheers. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I've just been giving back to the community, and because that's what I've 
in the last five years has been given to me the time, effort, getting getting the coaches to teach me how to box, doing very well. And so I just thought I'd have to give back to the community. And so what's what's that done for you? Um, for me, it's given me a lot of confidence because I've confidence to speak to kids where and I'll be able to say, look, if I can do what I'm doing and where I've come from, from my side, and where I'm from my side is, there was a lot of gang related activity and it's like, if you, if you can't do something well, you've got to join them, like you said. So that was kind of the aspect of the community and it was like, most, loads of people were going into crime and it was easy for everyone to go into crime, a lot easier. So for me, it was once I came out of the system of joining a gang, going out that route, and I found something I could do well in. And so once the club gave me opportunities to excel, for like we went to Brazil last year, mm -hmm. which was a great experience. Kids were looking at me like, wow, he went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. I want to do that as well. Right. So right. it was like giving them another pathway. And then I was able to engage with the kids. We've been in schools and saying, listen, you don't have to go down that route. You have to take ownership of what you're going to do. Yep. You can either go left or you can go right. Yep. So you have to take that ownership and you've make, got to make sure you're getting, doing the right decisions. So we've been to schools where there's a lot of kids that can go into gang-related activities. And we've been teaching them boxing, where telling them, listen, you can, you can still do well, even though you've got no GCCs, you can still thrive you still discipline yeah. yourself. Yeah, discipline well, yourself. the thing is, is that young men need a gang. The question is what the gang is going to be. Yeah. You know, and it can be the local gang that isn't structured very well and that is getting into trouble all the time, or it can be a higher order gang that's associated with some long term disciplined vision. Yeah. And so, I mean, everybody needs a community, and it's important for young people to, to learn how to interact with each other at a social level. And that's either going to be structured properly and intelligently towards some high order goal or it's going to be uh, kind of chaotic and, and, and violent. But there's no getting away from it. I mean, the necessity for it. Yeah. Um, so Nigel, uh, Nigel, sorry, Professor Peterson. Nigel wanted to I think okay. Hamden's been a little bit humble there. He's from, <coughs> he's from a Somali community which is pretty underrepresented in this area. Quite in some of the, a lot of the time they keep within the same communities. So Hamden's now branched out of that community into other communities and he's actually building those bridges between communities so people maybe from the smaller community who may not want to mix with other communities are looking at him and thinking well it actually works because they've seen as he said the success of where he where he's been where, he, where he's been before and where he's going to in the future so they see him you know achieving in whatever stand, whatever he's doing whether it's right. working so it's not just words it's not just words it's actions they see it as proof that actually, if you do commit and have those, those, um, those guidelines and those those boundaries, then you then you can also do it. And regarding the the gangs, every gang has has a purpose, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's bad or good. So it's it's a bad ideology. But we have a gang, but our gang's a different gang. Our right. gang gets up in the morning and we run together. Our gang trains together, and we're all part of a, part of a different gang. Our gang's, you know, a positive gang, right. so that's right. and that's just to echo your your thoughts. Can, mm -hmm. I, can, I, can I bring uh, Paul in because Paul hasn't <coughs> spoken yet? Paul, you've you've heard everything saying, you've heard what Professor Peterson has to say. What resonates with you? I think as soon as I walked in, I saw the big sign on the wall, um, and it says pretty much everything we've already said. You know, respect community and um, respect for yourself, which I think ties in responsibility. Um, what about male role models? The importance of a male role model for young men? Ma massively. Um, like Did you have that? So, um, my my mum and dad were married um, many years. Um, he left when I was eight. Um, and I didn't see him again for like 20 years. So he wasn't around. Um, so, like a lot of people, um, especially like my generation, so I teach myself how to be a man and try to sort of figure out what it is and what it means and how to sort of conduct myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there was uncles. I had a granddad raise us, but he, he, he died when I was, like, 13, which was pretty much hitting puberty. That's right when you right when you need him, you know. So, uh, yeah, um, met up with him when I was 28, like, 20 years later. Um, but there was a big gap there, so. So what was the consequence of that gap for you? Like, what did it, what did it leave you without? 
I suppose you, you don't know what you didn't have. Um, but right, right. I'd, I'd say, I don't know, maybe I'd be a bit more assertive, but at the same time, I don't think my particular father would have been a positive impact on my life. Um, very much of an older generation, um, interested in other things in terms of very violent, involved with a lot of stuff when he was younger that wouldn't have been a positive impact on my life. And I'm a different person because of it. You know, I've went down a totally different path compared to how he would have probably wanted us to. So what have you done that's right as far as you're concerned? What's worked for you? I'm in business. Um, I, I do a little bit of politics now. I'm interested in a lot more bigger issues. Mm. I always remember a story when, um, when I was a child that I was sat reading a book, and I mean, it would have been a picture book, you know, to like she was a baby, and, he, and my father picked it up and sort of cracked it across my head and went, you know, what are you reading that for? That, mm. that would have been the environment. Oh, yeah, that's rough, man. Yeah. There's a, the German philosopher Nietzsche said that if you really want to punish someone, you should punish them for their virtues. So you wait till you see them doing something good, and then you hurt them for that. Yeah. Right? Brutal, man. So, so, yeah. so that yeah. stuck with you. That Well, I don't remember that, but I just know it wouldn't have been a positive no. outcome. It was, it, it was affecting us through school. I was Because I was seeing his actions, him coming home, I was seeing... Um, you know, I was acting violent in school, as, as like I'm talking infant school, like five, six, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. was. Um, but then, the what scared happened to that aggression, Paul? Because Professor Peterson has talked about that the aggression lives within us, and how we learn to channel it and how we learn to control it is important. How did you learn? So, th literally, the, my my mom and dad put the fear of God into us after that incident, and but it went back over where I was afraid to stick up for myself. Mm. all through school because I was then scared to fight back, which was ridiculous. And I only sort of got out of that in my 20s. And uh, well, late teens, I started boxing, funny enough, and, and doing Thai boxing up in, up in like where I'm, I'm from. Um, but yeah. The uh, thing about anger and aggression is that it technically it inhibits fear. So like it's easy, fear tends to paralyze people and stop them from moving forward. And there's lots of things to be afraid of because you can be hurt and undermined and terrible things can happen to you. And so, struggling with that fear in association with vulnerability is some a problem that everyone has and one of the tools that everyone has at their disposal is well to have a goal because that that makes a big difference it means that confronting something terrifying is worthwhile because of what it might produce but anger as well and aggression also re remove fear they help you overcome it and so that if you can if you can integrate that into your life, then that becomes determination and implacability and unstoppability and all those things which are, you don't get without having that aggression integrated. So, and so you said that in your 20s you started to box and to fight and so, and, and also to stand up for yourself, those went together. Yeah, yeah, so I'm um, like obviously not competitively but just that confidence of going, well, you know, I think I was just afraid to, of hurting someone when I was when I was fighting back as a kid, you know, because I was told, you know, don't bully people, like when I was like five and six. Yeah. And that, you know, I got to the point where I was bullied all through my teens because of that, and then right. didn't do anything back. Yeah, well, but there's a lot of talk about, among, in schools about not bullying, and it's often very unsophisticated because it doesn't help people decide what the difference is between oppressing someone, say, and aggressing against them and standing up for yourself, or even playing. You know, like in my kid's school, there was a rule, this is a bad rule in Canada, is that not only could you not throw a snowball, you couldn't even pick one up, which was a rule I told the children that they were welcome to break. <laughs> I said, if you want to pick up a snowball and if you can hit a teacher in the back of the head with it, and that'd be just fine with me, but you have to take the punishment if you're willing to do it. But I thought that was just ridiculous beyond belief. You know, the idea that enforced weakness was something equivalent to to peaceable coexistence. It's just, a, it's just an insane adage. So, so th why did the boxing and the fighting help you? You said it, it helped you distinguish, at least in part, uh, between hurting someone and not hurting them. Like, if you want to defend yourself, you want to do it with minimal force, you know, and, and you have to have the confidence to do it. How did the boxing help you figure that out? Um, I'm unsure. I just know that it, it gave us more confidence in, in situations where I would have maybe been a bit, you know, 
I'm not sure how to describe it, but um, you know, a physical confrontation. I, I still hate confrontation. Yeah. I still hate confrontation. Like I worked in an industry that was very much lots of conflict, arguing, public Facebooks, and it makes us feel physically sick and sick, and it still does. Right, right. Um, but it helps yeah. us on a one-to-one -one basis deal with that confrontation a bit more than the fact I'm prepared for it and, and what have you. Right. N not right. that I don't want to come across as someone like that I don't even think I've had. I can count fights on you know two or three like in my entire life, but um, I don't want to seem like I'm sort of some violent man. I'm not. Um, but yeah, I think it was just the confidence. I, I want to bring Kevin in at this point, Professor Peterson, because Kevin, t tell us about your your background. Okay, so being brief, uh, as brief as you <laughs> can. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, you, you've been to some very dark places, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, yeah. So um, mine's quite similar to actually um, to the two boys, the two boxers. Um, but I come from a single parent home, and I came to London at the age of nine, coming from Paris, but. Both um, areas in which I grew up in were very predominantly known for violence, poverty. Uh, we were really deprived, and that's how we grew up. Um, so with that, with poverty comes crime. With that comes um, false ideologies, distorted ideologies. Mm. Um, so that's how I um, grew up, essentially. And coming to London, it was really tough because I feel like, like you just, uh, so many things that I've heard now, um, single parent home illness there's certain things i feel that are not that an individual isn't able to control but i think the f i think the things that are you are able to control you should control fully mm. but i think that kicks in when something has to happen so i think it comes from what it derives from what yeah happened so to you? from for me because you were in a gang yeah you were drug dealing yeah so for me, the reason why I did that was because, as I said, I adopted um, false ideologies and I felt like if I can't beat them, then I will have to join them. Mm -hmm. And in order for me to transition, something had to happen where from that, things like morals could derive from it, principles, um, discipline. Cause how um, did you find out about like how did you make how did you draw that conclusion w what what did you have to experience that taught you that so the turning point for me was at the age of 19 after drug dealing at 18 um i was invited to a church service and um a lot of people have attachments such as sport but for me it was faith because what it did it gave me a core set of values so i was traveling with no direction but with mm -hmm. the values that derived from going to church I had direction, now I had rules, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think without rules, you can't really travel with direction. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of difference between rules and, and opportunity. It's something that people don't understand very well because they always feel that rules constrain them and interfere with their freedom. But if the rules are associated with the discipline, then they point you in a direction and then you have a direction. And like life is, can be a very dreadful, uh, what, experience without direction. So what? why do you think church had that effect on you? Because it doesn't on everyone. And, 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 and why did you keep going? Yeah, so the first time was because there was a friend of mine who was actually giving a testimony of his life and talking about his transition and saying that faith has been able to make him transition. And I think when you come from a dark place with a certain person, you may tell yourself that you are happy in that place, but you're not. And I think if you can see light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. through a person that you can resonate with, right, 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 then you will eventually will want to be attached to that light. So I think yes. that's what made me transition. Yeah, in well, the first that's place. In, like one of the things that I think is true for people is that you need someone in your life that is associated with that light at the end of the tunnel. It's very, very difficult to find it yourself. It's very difficult to find it if no one around you can see it. But if you're fortunate, you'll see that somewhere in someone or parts of it in different people, and then you can put it together. And so, so what's been the consequence for you? What's changed for you? So what's changed since changing, so making the, the transition? Yeah. So after making that transition, um, I was still inadequate due to the fact that I left school with, well, we call it GCSEs here. So I left school with no GCSEs. And so what I had to do is take ownership now, like you say, like men had to have to take ownership. I had to take ownership. And um, from the from the good morals that I gained and the principles, I actually wanted to live a purposeful life. Mm -hmm. And so in that, 
two years later, I was able to start a law degree. So I was able to graduate in law. Um, I've been able to speak um, in ve various venues mm -hmm. and write a book. Can I just um, bring Kit in, actually? Because Kit's had an interesting story of Professor Peterson, suffered from depression and had suicidal thoughts during his life. Well, it's really picking up on this idea of like childhood experiences and, and enforced weakness, really, I suppose. Um, my parents separated as well when I was quite young. I, was, I think I was nine years old at the time. Um, and really what I encountered was a, si a situation of enforced strength, almost. Mm -hmm. So a family member told me, OK, your dad's not in the picture at the moment. You have to be strong for your mother and your sister. You have to, you're the man of the house now, so you have, this is your responsibility. You have to take care of them. And that's a responsibility that I took very, very, very seriously. So really from the ages of, I suppose, about nine until about 16, I never expressed a negative emotion. I never allowed myself to feel sad or at least not express sadness or anger or any sort of negativity in the home because I felt it was my responsibility to carry the weight of everyone else on my shoulders. And that kind of thing takes a very, very long time to deprogram and realize that actually this is sort of part of a narrative that we're told, I feel, as men, that we have a responsibility to be strong and to provide for mm -hmm. our families. And really, it, it's not always the case that we're able to or positioned to, particularly at, you know, at, at a young age. And Right, so yeah. there was too much for other people in that situation and not enough for you in some yes. sense. The balance wasn't right. The balance wasn't right, exactly. Yeah, it's a lot of responsibility for... I mean, mm. too much responsibility is too much, yes, right? And yeah. so you were, you were... And it's interesting because it sounds like no one really also helped you in a sophisticated way distinguish between taking responsibility and still being able to have, well, your own emotions and your own problems. Exactly. Because yeah. those things don't have to com compete. Mm. Yes, no, that's that. I mean, since then, I, I've obviously learned that that's the case. But at the time, you know, I, I, I just didn't have the, the language or the ability really to process what my role was actually supposed to be. And so I, I think I took on the most idealized possible version right. of that role uh, to be, you know, this perfect sort of uh, father figure, really, in the, in the home. And it really, it's such a difficult thing to to really talk about and to express because even looking at back at it now it makes me feel like sort of back in that place in a, in a way it's very it's very strange it's well it sound. sounds like you must have felt that if anything went wrong in the family that mm. it was your fault absolutely yeah yeah absolutely, yeah that's that's the case, a, yeah. yeah well there's a difference between fault and responsibility mm. you know i mean bad things happen to people in life and that isn't necessarily anyone's fault sometimes no. it is but often it's not mm. but the trick is to do what you can in the face of that, but not to tear yourself into pieces because it happens sometimes. Yes. And that's a really tricky thing to get right. It is. It's a, so it's a fine balance to, to strike. Mm -hmm. And something very difficult to do when you're nine. Yes. And <laughs> plus you were also struggling with loss. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. With the, yeah, the loss of the, the family unit and, and the kind of a grieving process there, which I never really completed until my mid-twenties, really, I think. And yeah, it's a very uh, a kind of a tenuous position that we that we find ourselves sometimes. I think. And then have you have you have you reconciled mm. that now? Do yes, you think? yeah, how re reconciled that uh, through uh, a lot of therapy. <laughs> uh -huh. That was the case. There was a, it was a, a case of a a year long in, intensive therapy, like sort of day visits to uh, an institution, sort of three times a week over the course of a year, and that started to put me back together to the point where I could function on a day-to-day -day basis. So basically. it started to lift your depression? It started to lift What me about on. it was useful, particularly? The ability to disentangle um, emotions from thoughts and also being able to give back uh, anger, I suppose, to where it needs to be. Right. Uh, so, so, and was that a consequence of having the opportunity to talk? I think so. Yeah, I think yeah, talking well, is very, very well, important. Well, you know, yeah. one of the things that that uh, I've noticed in my clinical practice, mm. for example, but also in talking to people, all, all the people that I've talked to, I guess, in situations something like this, is that, like, people people think by talking, mm -hmm. and they need someone to listen. And the reason you need to think by talking is because that's how you straighten out your psyche. Mm -hmm. 
right? And you do this w precisely what you said is you start to distinguish emotion from thought mm -hmm. and you put things in proper order. But it's very, very difficult to do that if you don't have someone to listen to you. And that's also yeah. associated with this issue about paying it, having someone to pay attention to you, you know, and you, you talked about mentoring young people is like one of the best things you can possibly do with young people when you're mentoring is actually listen to them mm -hmm. because people will, people struggle down the proper path if they have the opportunity to express themselves, but they need someone who's listening and providing some feedback because otherwise they can't do it alone. It's very difficult to think by yourself. Yes, yeah, I think that's the, that's the thing. I to an extent, the personal responsibility for, for your own happiness and for your own well-being is obviously a large part of it, and I, I do agree with that. I, I do think that we, we all need someone to lean on, and to an extent, we need, our, we need to have that community around us, mm -hmm. and really, we need to build the communities for ourselves, I think. Mm, well, it also gives, some, it gives the people around you a role, too. Yes. If you're doing everything yourself, then mm -hmm. there's nothing for them, you know, and that's not so good. It's, it's good to allow people, encourage people, to to help reciprocally that's yes, really the, yeah. that's really the issue it's kind of the, and the well that's the ideal for yeah. a family right is that yeah. everybody's helping reciprocally and mm -hmm. hopefully everyone is stronger as a consequence mm -hmm. you want exactly. that in a friendship as well Absolutely. if you can manage it yeah. so you know the second the third rule in my book is um, make friends with the people who want the best for you you know and that's part of that reciprocal issue is you want to look in your life and you want to find that part of you that's moving upward and then you want to find people who want that part of you that's striving upward to win. And, 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 and often people are jealous about that or they're angry because it didn't work out for them or they're cynical about their life or they're bitter because they've been hurt or, or they've learned that they can get what they want by taking it even though that only works in the short term. And so then they're not allied with the part of you that wants to move upward. And the the only thing you have in life that really is reliable is your desire to move upward as far as I'm concerned. You've got that under all circumstances, even when things break apart around you, you still have that. And and that's that, you know, that's that relationship between responsibility and meaning that everybody needs to know about. Um, Tim Samuels, the author and broadcaster and journalist has been sitting there patiently throughout this. And I think it's great to bring you in at this juncture actually, as we get towards the final part of this conversation, uh, Tim because you wrote Who Stole My Spear. Now, you've heard now from various people, Rhodes, don't worry, we will speak to you as well, with interest in some about military service and discipline. Tim, what are your thoughts? I mean, on, on the one hand, it's, it's amazing and it's heartwarming and I'm touched and I'm nodding a lot. I'm kind of in this sort of Churchill back of the car dog nodding the whole time. But at, at the other side, I, I'm kind of maddened by the experience that I, I've, I see in society where we don't take men seriously you know when i for this station launch men's hour a number of years ago the response was <laughs> what have men got to complain about you know people laughing in your face you know when i brought my book out it was like oh god you know uh, what are men whinging about and it's absolutely infuriating that because men are seeing because there is a notion of a patriarchy and therefore all men are dominant and they are men are some monolithic block and therefore we all have access to everything it's an absurdity. You know, the male experience is as individual as the female experience. And sure, there are some men at the top in business and in government who are doing very well and overrepresented. But I've met... And academia. Yeah. Well, you know, less, less about men getting into universities now yeah, than they used true. to. You know, that's they're, very true. They're, they're, they're a minority. Well, actually, the, the worst educational outcomes at GCSE are white working class boys. Exactly. In so when you, but there's this kind of lazy notion to be generous out there that everything's OK for men. And the men I've met writing a book, traveling, doing documentaries, sitting here today. I'm sure, like, you know, akin to the, the people of Jordan met. Men are having a really hard time at the moment, you know, and it's incredibly powerful and potentially toxic when men and boys don't feel like they can be boys and men. And in, in my experience, it gets channeled inwards into it, in, you know, that, and that brings about depression and anxiety. And if, if that's something you've ever had contact with in your life, you wouldn't wish it on anyone else in the world. Or it seems to get expressed outwards in this kind of anger and anger of the other, whether it's different minorities or immigration or women. And that is incredibly fertile ground for driving radical politics. You know, you look at the rise of Donald Trump in America, 
to some extent, you know, more men voted for Brexit than not over here. You look at the far right in Europe, and there's this male anger. But at the same time as this, people say, oh, what have men got to complain about? And if you don't take men seriously, there is a sort of societal time bomb there, and it's going to be bad for men, it's going to be bad for women. And it's just about listening well, to you, you the, the guys. Well, you don't take them seriously if you think about them as men. You know, that's yes. the problem with that that view of the world that places everyone into their group identity. You know, because then it's, well, all men are the same, which is, of course, absolutely preposterous. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's the same doctrine that drives racism, you know. All members of group X are the same, and here's their negative traits. You know, it's a, it's a complete abdication of responsibility for thinking. And the truth of the matter is that people in general have difficult lives. You know, because, well, because we're all mortal and we're all prone to physical illness and mental illness and disappointment and all of those things. People struggle through life and need to be encouraged. And the, and the idea that um, somehow men don't have problems is tangled, as you pointed out, with this doctrine of patriarchal dominance, which I think is the most appalling ideological idea that's emerged in the last 40 years. There's nothing about it that's useful. I mean, having said that, hierarchies can obviously become corrupt, and it's necessary to keep an eye on that, and sometimes they can become corrupt because they're dominated by people who use nothing but power. But to think that that's what all men do all the time when they're striving to be competent, and that's the fundamentally appropriate description of our entire history, is it's absolutely inexcusable. And it's certainly an unbelievably widespread doctrine in the universities. Mm. And, and, but you know, what's, what's kind of heartwarming at the same time is hearing uh, young guys and men being able to emote and express how they feel and not bottle, which I think, you know, we haven't done ourselves... Uh, the power of good over the years by men not being able to sort of say actually I need help or things aren't great or I'm not feeling a million dollars but you know I can still be a man and you know just hearing from some of the guys today and that sense of uh, honesty I think is, is so crucial for our mental health you know it is to to go and seek help and to say you know I might not feel great but there are people who can help me through this and there are ways around that so I think you know it's incumbent on men and, and boys to kind of see, well, not see could, vulnerability as we, a problem. Well, we could also say that, you know, th there's, there's a difference between seeking help and guidance, because a lot of the narratives we heard today are guidance narratives. It's like, well, I'm lost, or the pathway I'm on isn't as productive as it could be. I need to seek out someone who's got a better offer. You know, and that's, that's not even so much help as it is part of the proclivity to seek out adventure. Because like you guys have been on an adventure, you come to the gym, it changes your whole life. You travel the world, you know, you've, you've had a spectacularly successful young career. You've mentored all these young people. I mean, that's, that's advantage and opportunity. And to seek guidance is to exactly seek that out. And it's different than looking for help because help implies, well, that you're it implies to some degree that you're in a position of weakness and that's different than going out to seek your adventurous pathway forward. One of the things that people don't understand too, it's not laid out very clearly, is that a virtuous path, so that would be one that's oriented to some higher order goal, is a lot more difficult and requires a lot more courage and discipline and strength than an impulsive criminal path, even though, even though there's a certain romance that's associated with that that's probably better than hiding in your mother's basement, you know, but that doesn't mean it's the highest order way that you can possibly be. And so part of, part of orienting yourself in the world is to heed that call to adventure and to try to make the adventure as difficult as you can manage and as productive in consequence as you can manage. And, so. and it feels, um, if I can just say one more thing, that it's, it's got to change with school. You know, so, so much of the schooling system seems to play against boys and you know by the time you know boys are so many more times more likely to be kicked out or suffer from ADD or all that sort of thing and there's something about the modern schooling system which doesn't suit boys properly and a that's got to that change. A huge part of ADD proclivity mm. is the overwhelming tendency of a, of, a, of a fairly large minority of boys to need a lot of boisterous activity and play and if that's not allowed, then it's manifested in 
attention deficit disorder. There's very good work done on that at the neurobiological level. And um, the drugs that are used to suppress ADD symptoms also suppress play in animals. Mm. And so a lot of that, what's called pathology, ADD pathology, is a consequence of putting boys in environments that are absolutely not suited for them, especially for the ones that are more active. So and then that's turned into some sort of medical condition. It's really not, it's quite, it's quite not interesting. good. You say that, Professor Peterson, because I, I interviewed someone whose son of Jamaican origin was told that there was ADHD uh, in a school here in the UK. This child then subsequently moved back to Jamaica and is a straight A student. Mm -hmm. There was no change. Mm -hmm. It was just that that energy mm -hmm. that he had was immediately classed and put in a box here. Mm -hmm. And it was just normal there. Well, what's normal about requiring very young boys, young people for that matter, to sit without moving for multiple hours in a day. Like, who in the world ever thought that was a good idea? There's well, nothing about that that's a good idea. Well, well Rhodes, um, we, we haven't heard from you, and it's, it's, it's important that we do, because it's quite interesting about discipline and where you found discipline in your life. And the military helped. So uh, I come from Cyprus, where we've had compulsory military service there for the past 60 years or so, I think. So it's something that you grow up knowing and it's not imposed to you, but everyone is aware of it that once you finish high school, you go into there. Um, I wasn't particularly worried about it. Uh, I knew that I was a very anti-establishment person and did not have great taste for hierarchies. So I was kind of worried about that part. But although, that, although most people think that the military is associated with discipline or structure, there's an equally chaotic element to it. So when you go through basic training, there's an artificially created chaotic environment imposed on you uh, so that potentially when you go into warfare, you'll know how to cope with it. And I understood that I could thrive in a chaotic environment or uh, as, as you would say, with regards to the five personality traits, I was very low on neuroticism mm -hmm. when put into that environment. And it also might have something to do with being quite an open person. So um, by nature, I'm very impulsive. But at the same time, it was, it, it, it was almost an, a revelation to understand that out of this chaotic environment, structure could arise and meaning could arise, um, regardless of your political uh, perspective, so whether you, you don't like um, the function of the military itself. Um, at the same time, I grew up in a deeply religious family, and I grew up um, rejecting religion from a very young age. As Professor Richard Dawkins would say, I became a militant atheist. And, and I grew up, uh, Greek is my native language, and I was taught ancient Greek at school, so I, I was exposed to the classics, and that influenced my decisions in rejecting um, religion and the idea of God itself. But uh, then I found your lectures, Dr. Peterson, on the biblical series. And suddenly I realized that it's not all bad and maybe the same work that Joseph Campbell did uh, with regards to articulating the hero's journey, maybe that's what the people that wrote and edited the Bible tried to do. And they were trying to give you a meaning and uh, they, they were trying to convey a message beyond just belief in God. And like Kevin said, um, meaning can't be found in religion. But it, I think it can be found in more than one ways. There, there, there is not necessarily the need to be uh, deeply religious and adhere to the principles and doctrines of a particular church or religion just to find meaning uh, in those writings. Yeah, well, you found it in you know you found it in various ways, right? And partly in the military, but I mean, partly what those religious stories are trying to r relate to the degree that they can is that each person has a destiny that's actually crucially important and that in the pursuit of that destiny they start to they start to see what is associated with the highest orders of meaning one of the reasons that i believe that each person should take their place in life and that this is so important for each individual is that we have we all have that potential residing within us and it has the possibility of making the world more like hell or more like heaven and to the degree that we can have the courage and the faith to manifest that in a positive way, then we tilt everything in a positive direction. And that's not some naive sort of namby-pamby positive direction where everyone's nice to each other all the time. That's like the ongoing march of civilization that makes the world, that feeds people and, and cures disease and, 
and helps take care of children and, and keeps suffering under bay and keeps malevolence in check. And that's all part of that divine capacity that people have. And religious systems are an attempt to, to, to communicate that across the centuries. And you know, it, it's not an easy thing to divine from them, but it's a very important thing to understand. And I really do believe that you leave a hole in the world if you don't fill it, if you don't fill the space around you with the destiny that's part and parcel of the best part of you. And it's not good. We're running out of time. Um, and I kind of wanted to end with asking you about meaning and what meaning do you think your life has? I, I think that it's associated with vision first. You, you have to have a sense of, you have to have two senses. You have to have a sense of how terrible the world is and could be. And then you have to decide that you're going to move away from that as much as you possibly can, at least to move away from that. And then to formulate... Is that your daily? Is that the, your day by day? Is that your incremental progress that some may see? Well, that's not trivial, trying to move away from fascism and mm. all kinds of things. Well, that's it's, it's but what, what's, your a, what's your truth? It's good to have a conceptualization of yes. hell. Yes. And to be properly terrified of that and to understand that that's a place that you can put yourself and drag other people into and that it's sufficiently real and that's the proper message of the 20th century and then to think about how you might improve yourself incrementally so that that probability decreases and then you can start to develop a vision of what things might look like if they were better and strive towards that and partly what I'm doing now is, for me, trying to clarify the relationship between meaning and responsibility, which I think is, a, of all the things that I've been talking to people about, probably the most useful to help people understand that you need a meaning in your life to buttress yourself against the tragedy and the malevolence and the betrayal, and that you find that fundamentally in adoption of responsibility. Now that can become excessive, you know, if it's, if it's too one-sided and, and, and you don't see a part for other people to play. But fundamentally you need to carry a weight that's Sisyphus and that weight should be something that you truly regard as worth carrying. It justifies the sacrifices, it orients yourself in life, it provides you with a sense of meaning, it constrains your anxiety, gives you a certain amount of dignity and it puts the world it, it moves the world forward in a better manner. And I do believe that a, each of us every day decide with every decision whether we're going to make the world a better place or a worse place. And so that's meaningful for me. That's, that's, that's the essence of, uh, it's the essence of what I believe meaning to be, the instinct that orients you towards proper action in the world. It's a real, it's the most real thing there is. Thank you, Professor Peterson.